Good morning. Today is the day that we celebrate stewardship at McAllister Plymouth, and I'd like to begin by saying that my wife does not like this tie. <laughs> she didn't say exactly that she doesn't like this tie, she just said, oh, that's an interesting color. <laughs> when I was a young man, I had to wear a suit and tie to work every day of the week, and I grew to really dislike wearing a suit and tie. And I said to myself, if I'm ever in a position where I have more control over the dress code, I'll, I'll do things differently. And now I do have more control over what, what I wear on a daily basis, and I almost never wear a suit and tie. In fact, I, I may have gone too far in the other direction with my wardrobe choice to the point where my neighbors are concerned that I've become destitute. And I, I tell you this as background information, um, just because the fact that I got up this morning and put on this suit and this very attractive tie should be an indication to you of the importance I place on today's topic, stewardship. A lot of people don't like to talk about money. It, uh, it makes them uncomfortable. There's often math involved. Um, they just rather not discuss it. Not me. I'm a big fan of money. It's, it's a great tool for getting things done. Which brings me to the topic of our church's finances. How you view our church's finances is probably largely a uh, reflection on how you view life in general. If you're a glass half full kind of person, you probably look at our church's finances and say, well, that's not so bad. In the last three years, the world's been through one of the worst economic crises since the Great Depression. A lot of firms and nonprofits have gone by the wayside. Bear Stearns' is history, Lehman Brothers no longer exists, McAllister to Plymouth, still kicking. Um, and, and there's a lot of merit to that viewpoint. Uh, with the support of the congregation, our leadership group has made some difficult decisions and we have managed to, to uh, keep the place afloat. Um, but we have reached a point where the pledging and the giving isn't sufficient to sustain the needs of the congregation. We've been very fortunate over this rough economic time to have some one-time financial windfalls. We received um, some insurance money for hail damage to the roof. We've received some generous bequests from members who've remembered the church in their will. Um, we sold the alley to McAllister College. But there's really uh, a limit to those things. We can't always count on those type of things to help us balance the budget. There's only so many times you can sell an alley without being indicted for fraud. And we've, we've, we've reached the limit. Um, our goal this year is to get 200 pledges for a total of $480,000. Those are numbers that aren't outrageous given the scope of our budget and what we do here at the church. They're numbers we've seen in the not too distant past. Over the course of the last few years, we have seen a general decline in um, pledging numbers as well as generally the amount pledged. And we need to turn that around, and this is the first step in that. So we're going for 200 pledges for $480,000, which in my mind is totally attainable. If everyone pitches in and does what, what they can, I'm, I'm confident uh, we can reach that goal. I have, I have faith. Which brings me to the last portion of my discussion this morning, and that is why I contribute money to the church. I know that giving money to the church is uh, something that comes out of household assets, and so it's not just my decision to give money to the church. But I think, as I've already demonstrated relative to the discussion about my tie, not everyone in our household is always of a one mind on every topic. So I can only tell you why I'm willing to give money to the church. If you want to know why my wife is willing to give money to the church, you'll have to ask, ask her directly. I thought it'd be easiest um, just to tell you a, a story as to why I give money to the church. It's not, it's not long, and you won't be guilt-ridden at the end. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and at the end you'll be writing big checks to the church. Uh, I grew up in a family of four boys. I'm the youngest of four sons. And my parents were very big on education. And they felt, particularly my mother, that our education would not be complete and we'd never become productive, contributing members of society if our education wasn't built on a solid religious foundation. So every Sunday, they would herd my brothers and uh, me off to what was then known as the First Congregational Church of Fort Dodge, Iowa. 
And back in those ancient times, we didn't have a children's sermon like we have here. We would file in and sit in the rock-hard pew with my parents strategically placed amongst us to quell any potential uprisings, and we would twitch and squirm through the entire service. Our minister was a very kind gentleman. He was from Texas, and he would use a, a big booming voice when he really wanted to hammer home a point. Um, he, he smoked a pipe, not, not during the service, but afterwards in the social hall he had a pipe. And when you talked to him, he would nod thoughtfully. He was just like something right out of central casting for a, a minister in the 1960s. He, he had jet black hair that he would grease back and comb down so that from a distance it looked like it was painted on his head, which I thought was really fascinating as a, as a young child. Um, he loved a good sermon, and the sermon was the centerpiece of the whole service and would often go on for a very long time. He'd hammer home the point with, in his big booming voice, and then he'd circle around and he'd hit it again. That might happen several times until he thought he was coming in for a landing, but then he'd circle around again and he'd hit it one more time. It was, it was really something to behold. I remember a lot about that church, lots of kind, patient, generous people that helped me out, helped my brothers out. But I especially remember those services and, and those sermons. Even as a young child, like a kindergartner or preschooler, I can, I can remember those sermons. I understood a lot of them. I'm sure I didn't get every nuance that the adults were picking up, but I got the gist of them. Some, of course, went completely over my head, and some kind of made sense but didn't really ring true given my four to five years of experience on the planet. And one sermon that didn't ring true for me was his sermon on the miracle of the loaves and fishes, the scripture that was read this morning. Jesus speaking to this large crowd, and they don't know what to eat, and so Jesus produces a few fish and a few loaves of bread, and everyone eats, everyone's satisfied, and there's food left over. Our minister said, it's a miracle. I'm looking down the pew at my brothers, and I'm thinking, (laughs) "That that would never work. Our parents tried to do the best to school us in the social graces, but mealtime at our house was like eating with a pack of wild dogs. And I can guarantee you that a couple of fish and a few loaves of bread would not last long, there'd be nothing left over, and no one would be satisfied. The minister was circling around the topic again, and I was sitting there trying to apply my best childhood logic. Maybe they were really big fish. Like the kind you'd see on the Jacques Cousteau specials. You know, if you get, you get some 900-pound tuna, that'd feed a crowd. And then I thought, well, it's Jesus. He's the son of God. He's got some skills. He can walk on water. He can heal the sick. Maybe there's things he can do that didn't really get mentioned in the Bible, one of which might be mind control. Maybe everybody got a little flake of fish and a little crumb of bread, but Jesus was controlling their mind, and they're thinking, I could not eat another bite. I am stuffed. <laughs> Meanwhile, the minister is circled around. He's back to, it's a miracle, and I just let it go. I figured it's another one of those biblical stories where you just have to take it on faith and let it wash over you. You can't really focus on the details. Years later, as an adult, in a different church with a different minister, I heard a very different interpretation. This minister still thought it was a miracle, But in his interpretation, the miracle wasn't that the whole crowd ate a couple fish and a couple loaves of bread and everyone was satisfied and there was food left over. In his interpretation, the crowd saw the selfless act of Jesus, this act of thanksgiving, of offering up what he had to share, and the crowd responded in kind. So maybe there's someone in the crowd with a sandwich and they said, well, I've got this sandwich and I can't eat the whole thing. Someone can have half. There's someone else in the crowd who has a box of Tic Tacs. He said, I can share, I can share this. Just, just conjecture on my part, but that's, that's the way he presented it. And that made sense to me, because you see it all the time. You see it at work, at home, at school, at the church. And every time you see it, it is a miracle. There'll be some gigantic task, some imposing thing that needs to be done, and you think there's no way, we don't have enough whatever. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough time. Don't have enough money. Don't have the talent. And you, you're anxious and you're losing sleep. And then people start pitching in and things start happening and it works out. It's, it's a miracle. Um, every time I see it, I think it's a miracle. And the same thing is true 
for stewardship here at the church. Every year, I've been in, involved with the Finance and Stewardship Committee for six years, and every year it's like, oh, how are we going to raise this money? Oh, everything's so terrible. But every year, it works out. People share what they can, and it, and it, and it all works out. So right there in that story, you have some background on why I'm willing to give money to the church. Part of it's the way I was raised. Part of it's a lame attempt on my part to try to pay back all the people who have helped me along the way. Part of it's just my worldview that if, you, if there's something that's important to you that you believe in, you absolutely have got to step up and support it. But it doesn't tell you the whole story. To finish it, I need to tell you that my brothers and I all survived to adulthood, which in itself may be a miracle. And uh, depending upon your point of view, we may or may not be contributing members to society. But uh, regardless of that, I think everyone who knows my family would agree that my parents had the right idea. My brothers and I were very well served by their emphasis on education with a religious foundation. Now, every day I get up in the morning, I go downstairs and have a bowl of cereal. And while I'm eating breakfast, I listen to the news on the radio and I read a paper. I go into work where I read another paper. And then all day long where I work, there are these monitors, TV monitors in every room yammering on about the events of the day. Most of it's financial news, but it's also what's happening in Washington, what's happening in Asia, what's happening in Europe. All day long, I'm immersed in this news. So at night when I'm going home and reflecting on the events of the day, I never think to myself, you know, there's just too much love in the world. That thought never occurs to me. So I'm very happy that I'm part of an organization, this church, that's dedicated to teaching young people and reminding not so young people about the importance of love and faith and hope. That's why I give money to the church, and that's why I hope you will too. Thank you. <laughs>